Antes de que Gador Joyanos presente. Before Mr. Joyanos introduces our next speaker, I wanted to give you a great uh, piece of news, which is the fact that I know that this room is completely filled with people, although there are a few chairs empty. There are over 5,000 people who are following following us through social networks. They're following us on our YouTube channel and our Facebook page. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Good morning to all of you here and to those 5,000 people who are on the internet following us. I would like to thank Dr. Cretela for being here, for making an effort um, to come here. I remember and I wanted to share with you my first day um, in the um, in the med medical school with Professor Narbona, a professor who came from Sevilla who was very funny. And the first sentence he shared with us was, the first thing that you need to understand is that a child is not a bonsai. And we were all flabbergasted. Uh, but Kate is not a bonsai. And when he saw um, the surprise in our faces, he started explaining that uh, a child is not a bonsai. What did he mean by that? A child is not a small adult. And in the pediatrics world and in our um, subject matter and during all of your medical studies, you will understand, and I have come to understand during all of my years of practice, that a child is not a bonsai, that they have their own pathologies, that they have their own illnesses that only take place during childhood and that will not reproduce during their adult life. I have seen as a pediatric uh, doctor, and I'm sure that Dr. Cretella has also seen that, because a child does not feel and does not leave things as an adult does. We have to understand children as Dr. Cretela knows them. You have to love children as she does in order to be capable of getting, getting rid of any other interests that are not those that have to do with scientific interest and caring for the children. That is why she promotes and she asks for a real scientific approach in the case of um, children with uh, disorders or problems of sexual um, identity. That is why we know, thanks, doctor, uh, thanks to Dr. Cretela, as she very well explains, during their life, during the childhood and pre, uh, pre teen um, years, they go through different phases of sexual identity. And what you have to do is, is accompany them, be with them during all of those, those all of those stages that is why it is important to know firsthand from dr cretela how children suffer in these cases when when we are not with them and when we take them away from scientific truth but thanks to people like her there is still hope we still have a hope in a different path and she's going to prove that to us she is married she is the mother of four children she has a degree in medicine uh, from the Connecticut University, and she was a pediatric uh, doctor in the Connecticut Children's Medical Center of Hartford. She was a pediatric doctor for 15 years, and then not only did she care for her family, but she also was an activist. Uh, she was an activist in the. Um, American Association of Pediatrics. She's the president of the association, and she also was the president of the Sexuality, uh, Adolescent Sexuality Committee, and the Committee of uh, Scientific Policy. And she is one of the main researchers, writers, and spokespeople of the American Association, as well as. Um, before many different media. She's a member of the advising committee for scientific integrity and um, and this is an association of professionals who defend psychotherapy for homosexuals and sexual dysphoria, gender dysphoria. She also was a member of the steering committee of the National Association for Research and Therapy for Homosexuality. She's going to explain to us that sex is determined from the moment we are created by our DNA, that sexuality is binary, and she's going to clearly defend with all the experience that, as you have seen, she has um, of scientific truth before beliefs.
Thank you. Th thank you very much. This is an exhortation to schools, respect sex differences, and build a culture of kindness. What I want to give an overview of in this presentation is how we can build a culture of respect in our schools without promoting transgender ideology. We have to remem remember, first of all, what is the role of the school? The role of the school is to assist parents in nurturing and educating their children, both in academics and in ethical behavior. Why? Because the family is the first school. The parents are the primary educators of their children. The school is to assist. And certainly, schools are to be safe and welcoming for all children. So here's the critical question for us today. Must schools promote positive attitudes toward transgender identities to be safe and welcoming? We at the American College of Pediatricians have answered an emphatic no. In fact, it is harmful and dangerous for schools to promote the belief that someone can be trapped in the wrong body. Wrong body. This is harmful to all children. Furthermore, it is not necessary for schools to affirm atypical sexual identities or atypical sexual behaviors in order to recognize and respect and be kind to all students. So what is the foundation? What could we say the two pillars are to promote a safe and welcoming school, to promote res uh, respect? Virtue and facts. Respect begins with truth, the true facts about human nature, transgenderism, and bullying. It also includes virtue, quite simply, moral character and performance character. Oh dear. Two. Virtue, quite simply, is the habit of doing good. And by this we mean we want our students and staff and to put forth our best work and be our best selves. Performance character and moral character. Example of universal virtues, character traits for performance virtue, giving your best work, your best effort. Perseverance, organization, creativity, flexibility. These are all traits or virtues that are ex ex uh, accepted as positive by everyone. Moral virtues. No one is against kindness, respect, honesty, justice, humility, and courage. So what are the facts? What are the facts that research demonstrates for both transgenderism and bullying? Gender, very simply, and other speakers have addressed this, means male or female. It's very much tied to sex stereotypes. Grammar has a gender. If I have a friend who is female, amiga. If I have a friend who is male, amigo. Things may be assigned a gender. If I name a hurricane Gloria, I have assigned the hurricane a gender. If my husband chooses to name his sports car Lola, he has assigned his car a gender. People have a biological sex. We don't have a gender. We have a sex. It is genetic. It is there at fertilization in every cell of our body. In nature, reproduction is the rule. It takes a man and a woman, a sperm and an egg, to make new life. Sex is binary. Being a man or a woman, male or female, is innate and cannot be changed. It does not change. Birth defects do not invalidate this binary rule. Very rarely, there are cases of disorders of sex differentiation. These are ultimately genetic. They are extremely rare, in which, for some individuals, their outward appearance does not match what, would we, what we would expect from their sex chromosomes. 
These are diagnosable medical conditions. Very rare, less than, that should actually say less than 0.002% of the population. Again, XX, we are female. XY at fertilization, male. Sex declares itself in the womb as early as eight weeks gestation. A baby, an unborn child who has a Y chromosome at eight weeks gestation will form testes. Those testes produce testosterone. Every cell in that little boy's body has a Y chromosome. Every part of that little boy's body, including his brain, is bathed in a testosterone surge. He is male. No, no biological boy can be born with a female brain. Sex is not assigned. It is present at fertilization and declares itself in the womb. Again, no opposite sex brains are ever trapped in the wrong body. Sex is also binary beyond the sex chromosomes. A research team in Israel published very recently this past fall, they discovered that men and women express at least 6,500 genes differently. So looking at men and women, they found that there were at least 6,500 genes that men and women have in common, but if you are a woman, those genes produce one protein. If you are a man, it produces a different protein. They also discovered something else. They discovered that there are thousands of gene differences, also some that only exist in men and some that only exist in women. They found other genes common to both sexes in which for some they're more active in women and for others they're more active in men. This has consequences. It means the binary, the sexual binary is pervasive. It impacts every organ system of our body. And uh, my colleague Miriam Ben Shalom had one slide in which she said, you know what, when it comes down to a heart attack, it's not your gender identity that matters. It's are you a man or a woman? Why? Because if you're a man, heart attacks present one way. If you're a woman, they present another. And there are some medications that will be harmful to women that are not harmful to men. Our immune function is impacted. That's why there are some immune diseases that are much more prominent in women than men. Even how men and women respond to pain, poisons, and other medications differs based on our genetics and hormones. This impacts the brain. Again, every brain cell either has an XX or an XY if you are a man. And the neural wiring, because of this genetic difference, and because, which controls hormones as well, actually fr um, forms different language processing pathways, different visual and different auditory neurological pathways. We also process spatial information differently. Our emotion, uh, emotional and social processing occurs in different areas of the brain, and women's, the two halves of women's brains communicate much more uh, efficiently than men's do. Men tend to have a very, uh, their left hemisphere, it's, it's very lateral, not, not cross-wired, the same as women's. This is going to impact and does impact our behavior and our psychology. Dr. Leonard Sachs is a family physician, a psychologist, and an educational specialist. He is very, um, very much an expert on the sex differences and how this impacts education for boys and girls. Now, 
men and women, boys and girls. Obviously, we have more in common than we have different. We're all human beings. So the differences between what girls and boys can do are not very large. But the differences in how they get there, the differences in how men and women process and how we get there, can be very great indeed. And he points out that the failure to acknowledge these real sex differences can actually reinforce negative sex stereotypes, such as boys are bad at art and girls, pff, nah, science and math, not for them. So there, is, there are definite biological sex differences that we need to take into account in order to avoid negative stereotypes. What is gender identity? It is quite simply, it's cognitive in the mind. It is an awareness of oneself as either a man or a woman. Thoughts and feelings are not hardwired. Skin is hardwired, skin color, hardwired. Am I a man? Hardwired. If I have that Y chromosome, yes, it's in my DNA, it's who I am. Thoughts and feelings, they're not hardwired. We don't come out of the womb knowing that we are a boy or a girl. Dr. Lawrence Kohlberg outlined stages of cognitive development regarding the awareness of what sex we are. He said and found, he observed, by age three, most children can correctly identify themselves, yes, I am a little girl, yes, I am a little boy. But they don't understand that sex is permanent, often until age seven. There are some seven-year-olds who may believe if they watch you as a man put on makeup and a dress, they may believe you just transformed into a woman because cognitively, they are not mature enough. They, they haven't processed that a little boy will grow into a man and stay that way. A little girl will grow into a woman and stay that way. They don't understand. This is something that is learned. We should also have a definition of normal in medicine and science. And this used to be universally accepted. This was actually published in the Yale Medical Journal in 1945. Normal is that which functions according to design. Well, one function of our brain is to perceive reality. Thoughts that match reality are normal. Thoughts that don't match reality are abnormal. The definition of delusion is a fixed false belief. So if I stand here and tell you that I weigh 300 pounds and I am obese, please give me liposuction, you know, put me on a starvation diet and sign me up for liposuction, you would say, no, no, that's a delusion. You are anorexic. You need therapy. If I stood here and said, I have a face that has been scarred by, by a fire, I have not, but I believe it. That is a delusion, body dysmorphic disorder. If I stand here and I walk freely as I am, and I say, I am a paralytic, I need a wheelchair, I can't move, that is a delusion. It is body identity integrity disorder. They also go by the name transable. But there is one delusion that nobody acknowledges and actually promotes and sells to children. If I stand here and s insist that I am a man trapped in a woman's body, you all have to believe me. And you not only have to believe me, but you have to reinforce it and make everyone else do the same. This is what's being sold to children as young as preschool. Some schools are actually, and public libraries in the states, are actually having cross-dressers come in and, and read, I call them gender-bending books, to three-year-olds. 
And as you can see in the middle picture, quite sadly, a number of parents are flocking to these. When a little child who's three, between the ages of three and seven, hears stories and sees people, sees these men dressed as women, this derails their normal cognitive and psychological development. This is a threat. And this is dangerous for all children. Because once you convince children that they might be trapped in the wrong body, well, they get frightened. They entertain that thought. And if they come out and say, I think I'm the, the other sex, or I'm not, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm not a little girl, I'm really a boy, well, now all the doctors, teachers, everyone's saying, you must reinforce that. You must change their name, change their clothes. And then as they approach age 8, 9, 9 to 12, just early puberty, they will be put on dangerous chemical blockers, puberty blockers. This is a drug that has been approved to treat a disorder called precocious puberty. A child who begins puberty prior to age eight, that is a disease, a disorder. And the puberty blocker is healthful for them. For a short period of time, they are placed on the blocker until normal, period, uh, normal puberty should begin. But we are talking about physically healthy children being put on blockers and then being put on sex change hormones. When you combine that, when you put an, a very young child on the blockers and then on the sex change hormones, they become permanently sterile. The sex change hormones from adults, we know that they carry very grave risks. They increase your risk for heart attacks, strokes, diabetes, and some cancers. We also know in adults who have gone through the transition that 10, between 10 years and 30 years out from being on hormones and the sex change, uh, the, yeah, the sex change hormones in the surgeries, between 10, 10 to 30 years out, their suicide rate dramatically increases to the point that it is 19 times greater than the general population. And yet, we are taking little children who, if we supported them, if we supported them with, and their parents with therapy, to embrace their bodies, to come to see themselves as the loving and cared for little boy or little girl they are, and carried them through natural puberty, over 80%, over 80% of confused children would recover by their late teen years. Social impersonation can lock in the confusion or delusion sterilization from the drugs. And at age 16 in America, a teenage girl may obtain a double mastectomy. That's permanent. Sterility, permanent. Double mastectomy, permanent. Children have no cognitive ability to give true consent. I put this up here because this is a new resource that is wonderful for parents and schools. It is a picture book, and it's, it's a wonderful resource for young children. And it even speaks of genetics, so you could honestly use it with children as young as preschool all the way through middle school. It's entitled, I Don't Have to Choose. And it, def it basically says, gender and sex are the same. And my sex is determined by DNA at fertilization. This is available now in English and Spanish, and soon will be available in French. It is available on Amazon.com. Let's turn to bullying. Facts about bullying. We can all agree that this is a bad thing. It includes physical, verbal, 
written, electronic, and social acts of aggression, typically by someone in a position of a student who's more powerful than the one he or she is picking on. Now, there are many traits that can be targeted. Um, obviously, sex, ethnicity, race, other physical features, mannerisms, sexual identities, social, social economic status, disabilities, and religion. According to a World Health Organization survey, roughly one out of three students worldwide experience regular bullying. We care because bullied students will do less well academically, often suffer social isolation, and are at greater risk for mental illness, which can persist into adulthood. We also care about it because the ones who perpetuate the bullying are at greater risk for mental illness, and a large percentage, up to 60%, will ultimately end up with a criminal record. There are many worldwide bullying prevention programs that have been developed. And every state in the United States has anti-bullying legislation. The best evidence-based curriculum against bullying was developed in Norway. It's the Olveus curriculum. It may be used from kindergarten all the way through to age 18. Very considered the most effective, and yet, at best, it cuts bullying only by 30%. Why? Because bullying is a symptom of a bigger problem. The bullying curricula tend to focus on the strong versus the weak. When, in fact, when the American Sociological Association and the National Center for Student Aspirations looked and surveyed hundreds and hundreds of schools, found that what we typically consider bullying also happens between social equals and the popular kids and the wealthy kids. In fact, among wealthy and popular children, the cyberbullying and the social bullying is more common. So what we are dealing with is a minority of students who find it important to respect one another. Many students are, tra are treating each other in unkind ways. They do not value character. And the bullies who torment the, weak, the weaker ones, the weaker students, they make up only a small portion of the problem. So what can we do? This is my friend and colleague, Dr. Thomas Lacona. He is a developmental psychologist um, affiliated with Southern University of New York. And he's considered the father of modern character education, having trained more than 5,000 educators from 40 states and 22 countries. Essentially, the goal of character education is to create positive peer pressure within the school community to develop good habits to inhibit the negative behaviors. Bullying has been found to decrease when comprehensive character education is utilized. So we are speaking here of teaching children and rearing them in union with their parents to value respect based on our shared human dignity, not upon unique identifying traits. For success with comprehensive character education, parents must be involved from the beginning. Obviously, you also need the support of staff and the participation of students and community service organizations. Respect must be defined as upholding standards of behavior that honor the human dignity and worth of all. Respect does not mean having the right belief system or the right attitude. Vigorous debate is necessary for higher learning. It's necessary for a free and open society, and it can be respectful. Dr. Thomas Lacona, on his website, which I will make available to Citizen Go, has studied the most successful, what he calls, good and smart schools across America. And these are 10 strategies the schools employ. 
First, they used the Elvaeus curriculum survey to get a baseline reflection of their school culture. They share this with parents and students and staff alike. They define respect, as we discussed in the previous slide. They train their staff so that students and parents understand that the staff are there to respond to any student concerns and to also not keep secrets from the, from the parents. This is, this is a team uh, movement. A school touchstone is simply a motto or mission statement for the students to rally students, parents, and teachers together. A simple motto such as best work and best self. School-wide curriculum such as Olvaeus can be part of the solution. Community service learning. When schools are able to integrate face-to-face -face helping experiences with students and match them with organizations and people in the community, academic standards improve, attendance improves, as does a respectful climate in the classroom. Peer support. Encouraging children to stand up against bullies, to simply say, leave him alone, leave her alone. For students to be aware of their peers who are being excluded and simply say, hey, come sit with me at lunch, to befriend them, to listen to them. Reporting options. There needs to be an anonymous, maybe a drop box around the school so that, because sometimes students cannot, they're not brave enough to go to the teacher or the principal, but they would be feeling very comfortable writing it down and asking for help. Schools that have a student government that is democratic in style can actually deal with conflicts as they arise and with the help of the staff come up with solutions. The student run welcome committee, this, some schools, very successful high schools, have their senior students run a day of orientation for the freshman students. This was one way that some of the high schools eliminated years of hazing of freshmen. When you get the members of the different grades together to come to know one another and help, you create that culture of kindness. And I will, I will stop here. Um, actually, let me, I'm gonna end with, with this slide. I wanna end with this slide. This is the website where you can find many resources for comprehensive character education. Um, and they are available in English and Spanish. And you can also contact Dr. Lacona uh, through that website if you need resources in, in other languages, because he, he has been all over the world, and so he can certainly direct you. Um, and the last thing I want to say is that Dr. Lacona makes it very clear that comprehensive character education respects moral conscience, respects the diversity of moral conscience. And that's what's key. That is what keeps the parents as the primary educators of the family and promotes a welcoming community. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Delek. Okay, you have here your headphones because oh. I'm going to ask you some uh, questions okay. from the. Okay. Should I stand? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Got it. It's okay. Thank you so much. Muchas gracias, Doctora Gretel. Thank you so much, Dr. Gretella, for your presentation. Apparently, we have to sit down over here. We have a few questions from the audience, and actually, I have a few questions personally, and I would like to take advantage of having the microphone to ask you my question directly. We're talking about uh, children that have gender dysphoria or uh, uh, problems with gender identity. They need to be supported, and we need to prevent bullying. We need to prevent further damage for their adult age. But these children are also supported by other children who don't have this type of uh, gender identity disorders or problems. So how can this affect uh, other children who perfectly uh, feel um, identified with their own uh, gender and sex? 
how can uh, this issue affect them? How can uh, this affect them when they are having to deal with uh, other children who are um, maybe they're being forced to address uh, their friend John as Mary all of a sudden? or they're having to share locker rooms with them. How can these children be affected by this? Exactly, This is it's damaging on multiple fronts. If you are speaking, um, as I said, of young children under the age of seven, if they are being forced to call their uh, Johnny, being forced mm -hmm. to call Johnny Mary, uh, because today he's wearing a dress and that's how he wants to be spoken to, and then the next day, two days later, Johnny is Johnny again. Hmm. This is very confusing and psychologically and cognitively damaging to young children. And it, it, this is obvious. I mean, this, it, this is obvious. You do not need to be an MD or a PhD to know this. Uh, you just need to not be uh, a left-wing activist to know this. Um, now, <laughs> obviously, the other way, the, the um, the other way that it is most damaging, my colleague Miriam uh, Ben Shalom spoke to earlier. Girls and women are being denied private spaces. Um, <laughs> I should not have to worry about my little girl having to change in front of a penis. I mean, let's be very direct. I should not have to worry about that. And if I were the mother of a child who was confused about their sexuality. I would not want, my, let's say I, my, my little girl thinks, oh, mommy, mommy, I'm a, I'm a boy. I, uh, I want to go use the, the boy's room. Are you kidding me? I'd be afraid she was going to get beat up in there or raped. This is insane. Okay, reality is you are a boy or you are a girl and respect starts with the truth. Okay. Muchas gracias. Otra pregunta. Thank you so much. Another question. To what extent could the economic interest of certain labs, uh, pharma, big pharma, could have an influence when treating with hormones that could, well, um, hormones of the opposite sex? Big pharma definitely plays a role. Uh, I've not seen, <laughs> no one has admitted this in public, certainly. However, it is well known that uh, it is dangerous to give uh, hormones to women after menopause now. So the, f the pharmaceutical companies lost that market. But with gender confused children, Oh, all of a sudden, oh yes, give them puberty blockers. Oh yes, give the little boys estrogen, give the girls testosterone. These things have never, ever, ever been tested in biologically healthy children. We know that there are these dangerous risks based on adults. Lupron, a puberty blocker, is used to treat prostate cancer in men. It is associated with cognitive decline, but we're giving it to our children, to our little eight, nine, 12 year old mm -hmm. children. And again, as I said earlier, the sex change hormones, heart attacks, strokes, diabetes, cancers. How could anyone in their right mind put children on these chemicals before they're even 13, eight, uh, you know, and, and, and approve of a double mastectomy at age 16? This, this is child abuse. It's child abuse. Mm -hmm. Okay. Eh, podemos considerar a los Could we consider those parents who are orienting their children to that identification towards the opposite sex, could we consider them guilty? To what extent can we consider them guilty, those parents who are somehow leading their children in that sense? Some parents uh, have jumped on the bandwagon. I, I think they are in the minority. By that I mean parents who 
uh, before the child is even born, they're saying, I'm going to raise my child gender neutral, and I'm not telling you what the sex is, and they, they are 100% guilty. Mm -hmm. um, what I find, as president of the American College of Pediatricians, I more often am getting so many phone calls from across the country from distraught parents, parents who are saying, please help us. We, we don't want to put our children on hormones. We want therapy. But even in the states, there are now 10 states that have outlawed psychotherapy to help investigate what are the underlying causes of a child's gender confusion. So in 10 states already, that has been outlawed. And the left-wing activists, uh, the post or transgender pro-activists, <laughs> are fighting to make it illegal in every state. Mm -hmm. um, so most parents, I believe, want to do the right thing. They are being lied to um, and often being bullied themselves. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is a more technical question. They're asking what's the relationship or if there is a relationship between. I don't know if there is a difference. I don't know. They're asking about a very specific term. Is there a relationship between the gender dysphoria and the, the body integrity disorder? There is, yes. Um, th there is a psychiatrist, Dr. Anne Lawrence, in fact, who is a trans woman, transgender woman, so biological male, who is a psychiatrist, who has published, even in the, during the 2000s, published in the, the uh, professional literature that there are significant similarities between those with transgender belief and those with transable belief. So gender dysphoria, more accurately called gender identity disorder, is essentially on par with body integrity identity disorder. It's just a different body part. Mm -hmm. Okay. In order to end, although I know this is a question that could be the beginning of a whole conference, I would like to know how we should tackle the um, the care or the support given to a child who at certain at a certain point is showing that he or she does not identify with their biological sex before puberty before puberty um in the ideal world before the transgender activists um it was possible for me as a pediatrician to refer the parents and a child to a family therapist. And I only had one case, in, in almost 20 years of pediatrics, I had only one case of a little boy who, um, between the ages of three and five, said, Mommy, Daddy, I'm a girl. And he cross-dressed, and it, it just it got more persistent. The parents were concerned. I mean, this was the early to mid-2000s. The parents were concerned. Referred them to family therapy. During the play therapy, at one point, the little boy picked up the Barbie and picked up the truck. He put the truck down and he looked at his parents in front of the therapist and said, Mommy, Daddy, you don't love me when I'm a boy. Now the therapist had something to work with. And again, it, this is not easy, you know, but through hard work, they were able together with the parents to figure out that he misperceived his parents' attention to his little sister who had special needs. He was the firstborn. He went from being king of the hill to little sissy needs almost 24-hour care, and, and mommy and daddy are all focused on her. He internalized he was not lovable. Boys are not lovable. So if we can identify the psychological problem and work with that, in the family together, they get better, especially when they're young, especially when they're young. And within, within a year of therapy, um, he was improved and went on to a normal boyhood. Okay. Pues nada más. Muchísimas gracias.
Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Cretella, for your presentation and for, for having given us so much information. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I think it is time for us to break for lunch. Teresa Garcia Noblejas, I believe, is coming to, to give us some logistics information. Okay, good morning. I just wanted to give you some information that is of interest for all of us. We now have one and a half hours to break for lunch, and we ask you to be back at quarter past three, to be back and be seated in your seats so that you can continue enjoying the afternoon presentations. As a practical information that I need to remind you of, those of you who have headsets for simultaneous interpreting need to leave them on the tables where you got your name tags for the Congress. So they will give you the ID back. So you give your headsets, they will give you your ID back and you will take your headsets back when you come back in the afternoon. But it's very important to give the headsets back to get your ID and in the afternoon you will do the same thing. So at 15 past, we will be sitting down here at three, um, at 15 past three. And those of you who have purchased the ticket, the lunch ticket, 